Right, so without further ado, Andy, I'm going to make you host and I'm going to then let you introduce yourself and also introduce the focus of today's RIG discussion and meeting. Um, so you are now in control of our meeting, over to you. Uh, can you see my screen, Lizana? Um, not at the moment, Andy. Okay, just um, do that then. Let's have a look. How's that? There we go. Perfect. Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, yes, to introduce myself, um, uh, I regard myself as a, a community educationalist. I qualified way back in about 82, I think, as a teacher and worked in mainstream education. Um, I realized for myself that uh, the curriculum um, was not very rich or appropriate. So I moved across into youth work and community learning um, and um, moved in through a number of authorities and a number of jobs. And uh, I, uh, was at Cambridgeshire uh, in community education. And uh, around that time, I did my master's in um, uh, community learning, looking at Henry Morris. Um, and um, uh, yeah, a, a great experience in Cambridgeshire. But moved, moved on, uh, the last 25 years have been in, um, uh, in, in Cambridgeshire uh, and worked across a number of multi-academy trusts as a director of business. Um, uh, so we were looking at the academies program uh, coming in and I realized that uh, there were certain issues and that led me to my, to my research on academy and governance and it linked my master's in, in community and uh, adult, adult learning, um, which sort of linked to democracy. Um, I'm now uh, up in the uh, uh, northeast in North Yorkshire, and I lecture in education and, uh, and research in some, some business studies. Um, completed my, my doctorate about four years ago, um, and that was in uh, empowered participatory governance and looking at cooperative models. Um, so uh, what we have uh, today is a session uh, which is a strand of my thesis and a strand of the work that I've been working on since about uh, 2011, so it's 11 or 12 years really, um, looking at, at governance structures and how they've changed. I know um, what one of our colleagues today says looking is about to start a literature review uh, from 2010, so a very interesting time to start your um, your literature review and the introduction, obviously, of the white paper and the launch of academies. So I'll move through um, uh, this presentation. Um, what I would say prior to it is that our collective work in governance is actually now pretty timely. If you, if you tell people, colleagues, that you'd research in governance, I think most people fall asleep, don't they? They're just not particularly interested. They want to hear about curriculum and you know pedagogy and uh, or mainstream leadership, and you say governance, and they sort of walk away a little bit. Um, but what what I why I think it's timely is that of course the white paper um, acknowledges, as as will unfold in the presentation, that governance is an issue and governance needs to be addressed. Um, and the question that I'll pose towards the end of the presentation before we have our breakout groups is um, what forms of governance architecture do you think that um, you, you would develop or you would propose um, that uh, responds to the question in the white paper and the intent in the white paper. So Nigel's not he uh, here today, unfortunately, and I had half an hour, so it might just run over so at least we haven't got the, the pressure of a, an exact time to finish but nominally I've got from now about 15 minutes to, uh, reviewing what I regard as the problem um, and that's the problem of academization and then looking for the next 15 minutes or so at um, uh, what we re might regard as potential solutions um, democratic in, um, innovations, uh, governance in, in innovations that will address uh, what we what I introduce is um, the democratic deficit as a result of academization. 
Um, so I'll, I'll start uh, that now. So uh, we start looking at the problem and I'll just uh, look at the time because we're on, uh, on quarter past. Um, so we look at the problem. Let's have a look here. We'll probably move in slides around. Oh, that's it. We've got that. <laughs> uh, the problem uh, academies uh, and the, uh, the change from uh, the shift uh, of control that inadvertently accompanied academization. Um, so, specifically the problem is the rise of academies and when i was doing my research back in as you can see on that slide there in 2012 i worked uh, a funding from the education and skills um, uh, well the predecessor the esf um, uh, predecessor to the educational skills funding agency so i worked with them and i asked how many uh, schools were becoming academies because um, we just um, had to convert to an academy. Um, we were a, um, a sponsored academy at the time. And um, I had no idea, but at the time, way back here, um, uh, we knew, and I knew because colleagues were seemingly working on the conversion process, it was like an exponential growth. And uh, the, uh, later that year, the National Audit Office um, uh, published that the actual growth is was 1,034%. Um, and we realized, of course, that um, uh, academization was a political imperative. Um, it was a political construct. Um, and it was based on essentially flawed data. I won't go uh, too much into the, the background and I won't um, discuss uh, very much from say 1988 and, the, and marketization, but uh, we'll we'll just skirt that because I want to just, uh, focus on the uh, the problem as we see it today, uh, and then the solutions. Um, let me just remove our little pictures because I can't see my 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 screen part there. Um, so governance structures uh, weren't essentially, in my view, considered. The imperative was to move uh, schools, the uh, outstanding schools, uh, into academies and then um, uh, schools um, that uh, had uh, relatively low achievement. Uh, let's see, I've got a slight technical problem here. Yeah, so, so uh, it was to um, move schools on that hadn't uh, got uh, achievement uh, and uh, to sponsor them. I'm sorry, I'm just pausing. I seem to have lost our, um, our images here. I can see my PowerPoint, but I can't see anyone. Um, I'll carry on anyway, even if I can't uh, see anyone with, with this. Um, so, um, in 2015, um, David Cameron uh, was wanting to uh, convert all schools. He called it the education revolution, and that was to ensure that local authorities running schools were a thing of the past. What happened after that announcement is that the government had to backtrack because the public um, uh, and, uh, and the sector um, uh, didn't want that. They, they, they challenged the government's uh, direction. Um, but of course, the ideological imperative still persists. And of course, the white paper published just a couple of weeks ago, um, the intent there is to convert all schools to academies by 2030. But we haven't seen, have we, the same um, uh, sort of backlash to, to that, uh, to that statement. Looking at the, the move then uh, to academies and the notion of markets, um, I, I won't discuss it in any great uh, detail, but just to, um, uh, just to say that the literature's uh, quite extensive in, in this area. Um, can, can you see my uh, book? I've got Ron, I don't think Ron's with us today, but uh, Ron produced uh, this book in 98, I think it was, School Choice and Competition, Markets in the Public Interest uh, with Philip Woods. So Ron, of course, has been um, <clears throat> writing about the subject um, for, for many years. People like 
uh, Stephen Ball have been discussing uh, the idea of markets and new public management and have their place um, in our education system. Of course, academization um, is entirely reflective of new public management uh, and, and, and that shift. Um, of accountability and moving out to um, private trusts and privatization. Um, uh, a couple of points here, again from uh, Ron Glatter, academization effectively introduced market-oriented reform ideas. Um, Rhodes would um, uh, suggest that special purpose bodies, which clearly are um, uh, academy trusts, um, have replaced local elected councils. And Andrew Wilkins, uh, who was hoping to be here today, I don't know if he is, is um, um, uh, discusses the hollowing out of the state. So this notion of the hollowing out of the state and moving our, our schools are, um, from local demo democracy, democratically elected local authorities to independent private trust creates a democratic deficit. So I'd just uh, like us to discuss uh, the democratic deficit. Um, what I'd say about the democratic deficit um, is that it, the critical and under, uh, unifying fact of academies is that organisational power and control is positioned outside of established systems of accountability. The governance shift has weakened political engagement. It's created a democratic deficit and it's a phenomenon argued to occur when organisations fall short of the principles of democracy. Um, Rhodes informs us that there's a commonplace observation that there's a democratic deficit in the multiform maze of new governance. And I think that's what we've got at this moment in time. Of course, Rhodes was discussing that in relation to new public management. And for me, the democratic non-negotiable is the trust of the freedoms uh, to determine governance arrangements that are managerialist, exclusive, unethical, and um, broadly unfit for purpose. Um, if you've read the um, Management and Education Journal, the, uh, the governance edition, uh, it was uh, interesting in that uh, Vivian Porrett and, and Fee Stagg um, said, um, uh, can governance be ethical if it's not diverse? And that's the point that we make in, uh, in relation to the democratic deficit. So moving on from the de democratic de deficit, um, it's interesting and timely that we've had two, um, two reports, uh, well, a white paper and the House of Commons report. I'll move on to the House of Commons report um, that was published on the 25th of March and uh, just share that with you. House of Commons Committee on Public Accounts, it's the Academy Sector Annual Report. If um, you've had a chance to go through it, a really interesting paper. Um, uh, the report makes clear, I've just teasing out a, a couple of um, uh, key statements uh, from that report. It says it makes clear that there's a deficit of both accountability and transparency in, in the academy system. There's a clear effort to distract from the reality of academization, pushing schools into top-down corporate structures um, uh, that has left staff, parents, pupils and communities with less of a voice and little to say of the future of their school. This is the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee. Um, it's also saying that top-down reorganisations um, that increase private involvement in state services is something the public doesn't want to see. Yet, of course, we know since 2010, that's been the entire um, direction of, um, of government policy. Moving on. Uh, to the white paper, Opportunity for All, Strong Schools with Great Teachers um, for Your Child. Um, what did the NEU um, say about the paper? It says, uh, Mary, Mary Bowstead, the government plans for a fully academized system are based on spurious claims about the benefits of multi-academy trusts. The paper, uh, the actual white paper, goes on to suggest um, or say, strong trusts achieve economies of scale. I think any one of us could argue a case against these, but okay, strong trusts achieve, uh, achieve economies of scale. Strong trusts ensure robust financial governance. Well, actually, if you look at the DFE website, there's a whole area of um, DFE and ESFA 
um, investigations, financial investigations. And they arguably uh, relate to strong trusts uh, too. Um, governance wants to spread the brilliance of the best trusts. Um, that's what they want to do. It reminds me of the Academy's commission paper, Unleashing Greatness, um, was published ooh, a, a number of years ago. I can't think of the date, maybe 15 or 16. Um, I don't know what the basis of that actually was, but uh, Unleashing Greatness. And this is now, I guess, unleashing the brilliance of the best trusts. Um, uh, but the white paper does acknowledge that the system has evolved over the past decade is actually messy and confusing. And I think any of us that research or have worked in the system would agree that it is, uh, it is rather messy and confusing. So we'll just go to the next slide. What else does the paper say? Um, well, it, uh, it tells us that the government and the DfE um, will better regulate our trusts so the trusts continue uh, to, be rep to be responsive to parents and local communities. That's trusts continue to be responsive to parents and local communities. All trusts should have local governance arrangements for the schools. And we can discuss, this is the DFE, we'll discuss how to implement this with the sector. This actually relates to the question that I'll pose at the end of, our, uh, at the, end of the presentation when we're in our workout groups, just how might we do that if we were um, discussing with the sector or responding to this question, where, what direction would we take? Um, the, another point from the paper, uh, this is page 48 on the uh, uh, white paper, it says strategic governments um, uh, is an imperative. It, we need robust ethical, and it has to have a strong local identity, engaging effectively with parents and the wider community. So this is the direction now um, uh, that multi-academy trusts need to take. So let's look at a math governance structure that's in the, um, the DfE handbook. Many of you have seen this. What we, if it, if it is new to you, I'll just um, explain what we have here. Um, governance structure, yeah, I think you can see my cursor at, at the bottom, it says governance structure that's legally or contractually required is, uh, has got a solid um, uh, edging to the box. Um, so we can see members uh, is legally required, trust board legally required. Of course, local governing body um, is an optional structure. Um, members, uh, the DfE guidelines um, is that the membership can be a minimum of three, but they strongly advise that um, members um, ought to be a uh, five or more. So I, I would argue, well, you'll see, we'll look at my argument. I, I think that members could actually, once we invert and look at democratic in innovations, could be as many as 40. It turns this structure um, uh, on its head, really does invert the structure. Trust boards, trust boards um, uh, can be, I believe, as low as seven, um, but they tend to be around about 10. So I've got an example to follow this, which I believe is, is 10 or 11. Um, Yeah, I've got my note. It's, it's 10 or 11 because we're going to look at the Academy's Enterprise Trust. Um, so what does um, uh, an actual structure look like? This is um, the, the model that, the, that we have with the, the DfE. So let's look at a model. So what can it look like? Um, I can't see everyone on our uh, screen. Uh, now I'm sharing my screen, but it'd be interesting to see nods. It'd be interesting to know how many people um, uh, have, have actually seen this model. Um, the Academy, Academy's Enterprise Trust. When I wrote about the Academy's Enterprise Trust in 2016, I wrote that the Academy's Enterprise Trust model of governance is complex, multi-tiered and top-down. The board at the time in 2016 comprised of only four elected members 
and members of the community who are likely, in my view, to receive a place at the executive table. Um, the, uh, a little bit of background to the Academies Enterprise Trust. It was actually the largest Academies Trust, but it's now the third largest. It has 57 academies, um, 32,000 students, and the academies, the furthest south is Torquay. Um, the furthest north, actually, I can probably almost see it out my window here, but it's in Middlesbrough. Um, it has a budget of 234 million. If we look at the structure, um, oh, let's look at its aim. The aim of the Acad multi academy trust, uh, Academies Enterprise Trust, uh, their aim is to strengthen parental and community representation and voice along with a more democratic local accountability. Do you say that again? AET's aim is to strengthen parental and community representation and voice along with more democratic local accountability. What we have here is an academy uh, board um, of 11. There's 11 members on that board. Uh, the, the members sit above it. Now, the membership, even though the DFE is suggesting the minimum is three, but they strongly advise it's five or more, is actually three people. Um, it's uh, three, three men. And again, I'm minded about um, uh, the ethics of uh, not being representative and uh, is, is that ethical? It's uh, three people. The trust, uh, board of trust um, has 11 plus the advisory expert, Professor Becky Francis, who of course is CEO of the Education Endowment Foundation. And if you've read the white paper, the Education Endowment Foundation is central um, to, to developing our educational system. Um, so key trustees are uh, the former schools commissioner, former regional schools commissioner, Sir David Carter. Um, it, uh, the CEO, obviously is a trustee, is Rebecca uh, Boomer-Clark, former regional schools commissioner. David Hall uh, is a trustee, he's vice chair of the Education Endowment Foundation, and they've got their ad advisor, Professor Becky, Becky Francis. Um, so in this system, and in fairness to the Academy's Enterprise Trust, they have made an announcement um, that they're reviewing their um, governance structure and will be changing this, uh, these um, committees down here. I'll just um, uh, show you, you should be able to see my, my cursor. So we've got the Board of Trustees and then the mechanisms of leadership and management, but the governing board, the local governing body is, is right down here. Um, and the local governing boards, which I'll unpack with an example from the uh, example in Middlesbrough, the example um, is a, doesn't really have, in my view, um, local representation. Local representation is, is even below the local governing board with parental and community advisory boards. But these in, um, in September, the local governing board, I believe in the parental and community advisory board are going to merge. Um, so um, what we do is ask ourselves, is this a classic example of the democratic deficit? Because the local governing board here really um, it should be up here somewhere, should it not? I think, in my view. Um, and not only should it be up here, um, it should enable local participation. It should uh, encourage that local voice. And uh, in my view, it, it doesn't have that at this moment in time. But maybe with um, um, Professor Becky Francis and uh, uh, a redesign, it may, it may be leading. Um, who knows? So I think that that is the problem, and that's an example of the problem. Um, uh, the AET, uh, in my view too, um, when I looked at its uh, annual report, I was rather uncomfortable in reading um, the third party transactions. And as we know from 2013, AET had a formal warning notice and the Guardian headline was Academy chain under fire following revelation of payments to bosses. 500,000 in three years. It was criticized by Michael Gove. Um, and I'm minded of Ron Glatter's uh, statement that the centers of power are remote from the tempering influences of the citizenry, because we've got the citizenry somewhere down here, 
um, but the power and the um, uh, yeah is is located right up here. So this. I believe is the problem. It's the problem we face. So let's look towards some solutions. Um, so towards a new architecture for school governance, the uh, article that I produced, uh, that I wrote with Nigel, that's in the MIE, um, has essentially that as the title, um, the new architecture for school governance, because I think we need to be looking at that. Um, and we called it post new governance as well uh, within the paper, because if we're looking at new governance and Stephen Ball's written about new governance and new public management and the third way. Um, uh, what we need now, if we're in an, in an environment of new governance, we need to move beyond it. Um, and we call that post new governance and it's creating a new architecture of governance. Um, oh yeah, Andy, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I don't have the hosting power, so can you just check? There might be colleagues who want to join. Um, I have a, had an email to say colleagues were trying to get in. If you could oh, just let right, them in. waiting room, okay. Yes. Um, and That'd I can great. admit them, okay. Sorry, I didn't, uh, that doesn't pop up on my screen until, unless I open it. Um, okay, thanks, Andy. Okay, thank you. Yes, just let me know if anyone else wishes to join. So we have a model um, that I think is a, is a solution. It's empowered participatory governance. Um, it's identified as a progressive um, organizational reform strategy. It deepens democracy and Fung and Wright argue that it depresses um, the values of participation deliberation and empowerment to the limits of feasibility. It's quite interesting, um, uh, Achong Fung actually now um, is um, director of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, and he works extensively on, on voice and, and participation and, and democracy. I'll say just a few words about um, empowered participation participatory governance and Fung and Wright work from uh, uh, and then we'll look at uh, how this can apply to the academy system. Um, Deepening Democracy, the book itself, um, which is which is this book, um, uh, very definitely worth getting hold of and, and um, reading that book, um, uh, presents four case studies and its experiments in empowered, participate, empowered participatory governance. Um, uh, the innovations attempt to remedy the failures of top-down agencies by deploying participation and deliberation uh, as tools to enhance effectiveness. There were four case studies. One was education and policing uh, in Chicago. One was uh, habitat conservation across the United States. There was um, participatory city budgeting in Brazil and democratic decentralization in West Bengal. Um, the interesting one for us is the case that relates to education in Chicago, um, a city it, it um, uh, informs us is, uh, was characterized by poverty and, e and inequality. Um, bureaucratic school systems were failing to educate the, ch the city's children on a large scale and um, uh, Interestingly, local groups formed um, a vocal social movement that managed to turn the top down heavy bureaucracy um, on its head and local schools councils were established on a legal footing. And the reform, according to Fung and Wright, uh, created the most formally directly democratic system of governance in the United States. Um, we will discuss, I mean, the, the book is called Utopias, and we realise it's not actually utopian, and there are, there are issues with it, but as a, um, a, a lens, it's a very useful conceptual lens. I'll just uh, move on. So there are three strands um, to um, uh, EPG, Empowered Participatory Governance, bottom-up participation, deliberative solution generation and practical orientation. And I'll just unpack those briefly and then we'll uh, link them to um, uh, governance structures. So bottom-up participation 
uh, is where, whereby new participatory channels are established for the most directly affected by the target problem. Uh, typically, ordinary citizens and officials in the field apply their knowledge and interest to the formation of solutions. So it's, if we're looking at, and I, I, I always, having studied this, try to apply um, EPG to, the, to, to governance systems to see if it ticks these boxes. You know, it, it's uh, like a litmus test of governance. So is it bottom up? Does it um, uh, display characteristics of deliberate, deliberative solution generation? What does that actually mean? It suggests that it's whereby participants listen to each other, they discuss, they deliberate, they listen to each other's positions, generate collective choices after due consideration. So it's about discussion. And a practical orientation, and this links to the architecture of governance. Um, I don't feel that the Cabinet Enterprise Trust has a practical orientation. How, how can we get channel that governance voice um, to, uh, to, within the organisation to have a meaningful impact? So practical orientation, uh, according to Fung and Wright, is whereby the distinctive feature is that the architecture of governance is established to address concrete concerns, the actual real issues that the school uh, or the organization might be grappling with. It's a practical focus that creates situations in which actors, accustomed perhaps to competing for power, begin to cooperate and building lasting and build lasting and meaningful relationships. And I'd like to just show you what that might look like. My own research looked at um, cooperative college model. So what I present in the next few slides is a cooperative college model, but then a democratic innovation that may take that further. Um, and um, yes, let's, let's get onto that and um, I'll be able to explain it as you see the models. So my own research looked at cooperative college models. Now this actually was for a single academy, um, a single academy, not the multi-academy trust. But I, I do believe the, um, the principles apply. So what we had here, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but I know Nigel uh, unfortunately can't make it. So I was going to spend some of his 10 or 15 minutes uh, on this. What we have here in, a, in this model, if, particularly if you're unfamiliar with it, we have members. Um, now, the members here are not like the members in the DFE model. It's not like the three members of the Academy, um, uh, uh, Academy's Enterprise Trust. Um, and what, who are they members of? But the members here are parents, carers, um, staff, learners, community, and alumni is an, is an optional model. And um, the, the members actually join, they physically fill in a membership form and, and become a member and join a membership group. Now these membership groups then elect, formally elect uh, a forum. And it's, so it's an elected consultative body. In the example, um, this cooperative forum, uh, it doesn't really matter what you call it, but this body of people, the members, um, uh, have got a very strong voice. They are able to elect um, uh, two parents from this body. So the governing board, who actually in this model are trustees, um, is a very strong board. It has 20 um, uh, governors uh, who are, are trustees. Um, uh, I've got a number of points here that I'd share with you uh, on this governance structure. The cooperative argue that the governance structure provides a clear line of accountability from those that manage the school to those that um, use the school and its extended services. Governance voice, I call governance voice, is not just up here with the governing, it's actually um, vertical and laterally across the organisation. So governance voice isn't limited to the governing board at all. Um, the Cooperative uh, College argue that the forum is the champion, uh, will champion the democratic voice of its members. Um, so it's a really interesting model. What 
um, we I found from analysing this model is that if um, if we've got a, a parents that can be elected here um, from uh, from the forum and from its body, why can't we just generally elect um, uh, to the forum and the forum? could actually then take on board uh, the role of the trust. So let's, let's explore that a little bit further. Um, so I've, in the, obviously we talked about bottom up and members would normally at the, be at the bottom, but I've, I've presented it this way to give a direct comparison to the DFE model. So um, post new governance in this format then, um, I termed a micro governance network because uh, because it's sort of wrapped around the school. There's a, a the governance um, structure embraces and listens to the voices of all stakeholders, and this um, this structure um, uh, is a, a practically orientated structure. So what we have, or what we could have. Um, and I know that there's flaws with this, but it's presenting um, an, an alternative structure, one that inverts the current power base. So we would have members, and the members typically could be of a cooperative school, about 2,000. So 2,000 people. Um, so we've got membership groups. Now, if these membership groups here um, are elected to a 40 strong body, then why can't this 40 strong body have a funding um, agreement with the DFE? Because at the moment, it could be a very small group um, uh, of unelected individuals. Um, the trust, therefore, could then create its governing board. And the governing board, um, in the example, can have 20 members. And the 20 members, um, uh, interestingly, within uh, the cooperatives um, had, in my view, a massive amount of governance capital. And if we've read um, Chris James's work on governance capital and agency, um, you'd see, um, relating to his work, that uh, it's a very strong board, and these boards perform um, in his research um, best, the, the, the stronger, stronger bodies. Um, governance capital and agency, the governing board consisted of 20 members providing capacity and skills and the capacity to sustain 19 positions of responsibility, including an array of linked governors with a specific oversight and, and eight committees. Um, so I'm, I'm going to um, finish on this um, uh, alternative model, which is a micro governance network uh, around the school, because uh, the governors are from all different aspects um, of the community. And I'd finish, um, and I've just got a few concluding points. Um, empowered participatory governance isn't, and democracy that, that's linked to that, isn't a new concept. Uh, we draw on John Dewey uh, from 1937 when he advises that democracy is a way of life and that democracy and democratic ways um, of thinking must be engendered within social relationships and schooling. When I worked in Cambridgeshire Community Education in the early uh, 1990s, um, we were drawing on the visionary and inspiring work of Henry Morris and his mem memorandum, and that was 1924, that established centres of community learning and democratic endeavour with active members associations, very strong men members associations that were members of the local community. So it's not new, but we seem to have lost it along the way. And I'll conclude with a final statement from a, a parent um, that I spoke to in my research, and um, I've not forgotten this. Um, what she said, um, and paraphrasing, was that um, you can buy in skills to a governing body, um, but you can't buy in empathy and understanding. You actually need the community for that. So I'll finish there and I'll stop sharing this and hand back over to yourself, Ms. Anna. Thanks so much, Andy. And what a thought-provoking point to finish on. Um, just to update you, huge apologies from the Balmer's office. Um, we have had 
a change of hands and colleagues and what seems to have happened is that um, the link didn't go out to everyone. Um, I've sent the link out um, using the list I had, but I didn't have um, the list of everyone who signed up for today. But Nicola promises us that um, she will send out the recording um, ASAP once we're ready to send us out. Um, so I'm really sorry that's happened, but um, Nicola's still learning her job um, because the lovely Rachel's left us as well. And so she she's very upset that it's happened, but um, you know, these things happen. And that is why some of the colleagues you were expecting today are not in the, in the room. But um, these things happen, so we'll just make the most of it and send the recording out. So brilliant. Um, thank you so much for that and really thought provoking. And I love the final, final thought on the importance of community and that important emphasis on empathy and understanding and how we as governors need to bring that to the table to really do what's right by everyone. Um, so Andy, um, you want people to move into breakout rooms. So if you just want to explain to colleagues how you would want that to unfold, then I can set that up for you. Right, okay, thank you. Um, yes, it, it was around the white paper, um, and I, I suspect that there'll be, um, well, there will be discussion about this and government um, uh, uh, consultation, I suspect. Um, so the white paper on page 48 states that, so trusts continue to be responsive to parents and local communities. All trusts should have local governance arrangements and we will discuss this um, uh, with the sector. So what we could look at is, despite local governance, in my view, being a misnomer, how can this be implemented? What form of governance uh, uh, or what form would your governance architecture take? Lovely, thank you. And how long would you like colleagues to discuss this? Uh, how long have we got? So we've got 10 minutes. So 10 minutes, yeah. Discussion on, on that, I think. Absolutely. So, I'll, I'll break. I'll put you into breakout rooms, and I'll bring you back then within ten minutes' time, and then we'll ask each representative from each room to feed back to us if that's okay to, with everyone. So brilliant! Thank you so much, and we're about to go. Um, Michelle, are you okay or do you need any support? I'm Benedict, I can see that you haven't moved to your room either. Is there anything I can do to help? Uh, I yeah um yeah so i um i got interested in governance when i was a teacher of english language and um, a few years ago um before joining bcu i taught english in colleges for some uh, 20 years and um when i was um before i was doing uh, kind of got interested in doing a phd i got to speak to a colleague of mine who was the staff governor at the college and um Kind of got talking to him and and ask him what he did because even though he was a good friend of mine, I never knew he was a staff governor. And um, so he gave me a list of things he was supposed to do, and then he told me he wasn't doing any of those actually in real real practice. So I kind of got interested, and so when I got a chance to do um, a doctorate at Warwick, I thought I might actually want to, you know, being having been a teacher lecturer for so many years i thought um i, I wondered what sort of role um teachers and educators could play in governance of their their own education institutions so that's my um research so um and i'm i am very grateful to belmars for 
uh, funding the, the project and um, uh, Birmingham City University where I, I work at um, is the host and you know collaborating and Andy um, and Bernadette have agreed to become uh, co-researchers on the project so which I'm um, which I think is a really great addition to the, the research team. So it's, it's only a one-year project. Um, and so I'll share my screen. Um, let's see if I can do this. Um, I normally use Microsoft Teams, but um, I think I've got it. Um, can everybody in the audience see the screen? Um, not yet. I think you just need to select, so click on your slides, oh. and then, then we're there. Great. Perfect. Okay, good. Um, so I, I, I'm basically uh, where we are in Birmingham. My research is actually is focused on Birmingham, and we, we are focusing on educators, this uh, teaching or academic staff governors, um, and their roles, their professional status and professional roles in a um, number of institutions. So we've chosen uh, four institutions across the different sectors of education, including one university, uh, two schools, and one college. Um, so um, it is slightly connected um, in, I suppose, in many ways to the idea of participatory governance, but I'm looking at one constituent, one constituency within the governance, which is um, academics or teachers, for example. Um, all right, see if I can move on. Yeah, so the, the, the main um, idea behind um, the research project is to understand how academic and teaching staff governors contribute to the governance of their own education institutions as staff members. And then to find out the value and to establish the value of their roles um, as academics, whether they are uh, they could be a professor at a college or a teacher at a school or lecturer at a, um, uh, at a college um, and or, at a, or university. And the we have um, um, so within that aim, um, we chose uh, we invited a number of institutions to take part. So we managed to get. Um, a primary a maintained school, primary school, and secondary school, and a further education college. And uh, our post 1992 university. And then we also have the academic staff governors at the institutions taking part as well. So that's um, basically the participants across the various um, data collection methods. So um, is a is a kind of a guiding framework of concepts. We're looking at some of these uh, themes, which uh, which I'm sure Andy and and those who are and Andy obviously knows all of this uh, because he's part of the project. But also people um, people interested in democratic governance would be uh, would be familiar with some of um, these things. The idea of, for example, role clarity. Once you become a governor, how does that uh, impact on and their role and the value of their role, their contributions, and how free they are in their role. The, the profession today is a, a restricted uh, professional status attached to the role. And the idea of democratic free engagement as staff members in strategic uh, decision making. Um, but also, um, the, 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 some of these, many of these concepts, I would say, perhaps all of these are in various forms captured in the current um, governance literature. For example, status in value, uh, Vani Sital, who is actually from a um, corporate governance background, talks about, um, you know, once somebody sits on a governing board, are they part of the dominant coalition? And if they are or if they're not, uh, it could have an inf um, influence on the quality of governance. If all members of the governing board are not uh, part of the active or dominant coalition, then, then there is some sort of lost resources there. And, but also it depends on the status and the value depends on what, it, what it, 
actually what are the governing, governing activities they are taking part and they can take part, whether it's um, decision making of various resources about finances and so on, or uh, strategy and teaching and learning. So it, it does, status and value does connect to the idea of um, what activities they engage in or they're able to engage in. One of the big studies recently came out from a college studies, that's Watson, Kate Watson at Sterling University and Ron Hill. And, um, and I think Gary Husband, they established the idea of um, governing activities and their behavior, again, corporate governance comes here. You know, what exactly are the behaviors of governors when they engage in um, governance? And some studies uh, which I was I've been involved in plus going back a few years, uh, decades, I think um, early, uh, Peter Early, Professor Peter Early and Chris uh, talked about uh, teachers in schools being really, teachers as governors um, have a very restricted role on boards. So I wanted to see that this is still true um, today after 20 years or so later, but across schools, colleges and universities. Um, we also um, want to talk about how clear teachers as governors are about their role across these institutions, um, especially, um, and I'm sure, things are getting even more muddled up with economization. Uh, but um, we're talking about colleges and universities as well here. Yeah. Uh, but by default, I, I'm sure you would all agree, teachers have multiple roles in the institutions. They could be teachers, managers, as well as governors, or some of them um, uh, in, a, in a school, for example, they could be parents too. So all these multiple roles, um, how do they balance all these roles to fulfill their governance role? And then how, could, how does that impact on accountability in governance? Again, impact on quality of governance. Uh, the, on the governing board, you have a variety of professionals and teachers, academics and professors and lecturers are also belong to a professional body. So there, is, there are suggestions that their professional affiliation could influence their role in governance. Sometimes it could in fact conflict, it could rise to conflicts, you know, uh, things like um, professional autonomy and therefore how autonomous are they when they're contributing to governance. Um, and Becky and Young um, talk about professional affiliation. So there's a, a vast body of literature on uh, professional, uh, the idea of professionality as well, and therefore how does their roles in organizations, whether it's governance in schools or colleges, um, how that affect their role. Um, educators like other governors uh, with various professional backgrounds have a professional capital, so we'd like to see what sort of professional capital they use in their governance. Uh, decision making so meeting or in meetings to uh, in, contrib in their contributions to meetings. There is um, we have talked a lot about this today, and I think this this should go on this idea of democratic contribution, um, and um, and Alan's work, um, Alan and the and the Alan and uh, you know and the I mean you we talked about in your paper, but also some of the uh, work by Hopkins touch upon democratic con contribution. And I think that's been the main talk today so far. But um, the, uh, educators, they, they, they are part of you know, kind of an, a democratic, I would say, constituent in, in governance. So how much are they able to, or how much do they contribute in that fashion, in a democratic fashion? Um, Within this also, there is this idea of um, understanding um, role clarity because the role can be understood as the formal position as, for example, the, um, described in governance, um, uh, governance documents and instruments and 
regulations from you know the state and so on but also then how is it perceived and understood by the role holder the, the educator for example is there a, a distance a gap between the way it is formally captured and the way they understand and then then in in the field on you know uh, in governing boards what exactly do they do is is there again another gap between the, the formal position as described as well as the way they have understood and what they exactly do so these are um, the different uh, roles how we we would like to use understand and conceptualize any findings using this uh, framework uh, the governor role framework so the so the formal role how it's understood and what exactly um do they do in their governance practice? And um, Bernadette, you're here today. Um, you know your work on um, committees of practice um, could perhaps I think um, contribute to a better understanding of uh, academic staff governor roles. So in this study, uh, we're calling them ASGs, which stands for Academic Staff Governance. Or in this course, it will be teacher governors or teaching staff governors. And in colleges and universities, they might be called academic staff governors. So, is there a committee of practice um, which they can um, rely on uh, to improve their practices? So, hopefully, we, aim, we want to um, use these frameworks to make sense of the um, staff governors' roles. To, Teaching or academic staff governors work across different educational institutions. And then by then we want to ask for use a typology of the role to, aid, uh, to enable us to understand the role. And, and then it could become um, further research into the way educators contribute to governance of educational institutions. Um, but also, we're kind of aware that um, the different models of governance can be a contributing factor in uh, to the extent which um, ASGs or staff governance can engage in and contribute meaningfully to governance. Um, so if there is a, you know, we've talked about partnership model today. So, and I have put that in blue. So the bluer the model, the more possible the more opportunities it gives rise to democratic governance and therefore staff, uh, teaching staff can contribute as well. The red ones, for example, policy governance model, the agency theory or compliance and skills base and rubber stamp model, all these are very, I would say top down approaches to governance and therefore anybody, whether you're a staff governor or parent governor, you would have less opportunity to contribute. So that's why I put them in red. Um, so the redder they are, the less likely um, that a few opportunities for democratic contribution from any constituent in governance. Um, there is also the idea that the role, because of the nature of the, um, uh, the role of academics um, being staff members of the institutions they, they work at, it could be quite a uh, restricted role uh, depending on the um, uh, on the model uh, and then what exactly um, are the activities they engage in um, and so the, the insiderness as staff members that, that could become an issue but then they their roles are seem to be very valued and um, there is uh, this research showing they are um, valued members of governing boards um, so yes um, these models that i've just talked about i think could you know it'd be interesting to see how academies how red or blue academy multi, multi academy trusts are if you are to put them on this model um, and then in a new post new uh, post Governance or post new governance model or network. Um, could we come with a bluer model of governance? Um, that would be interesting. 
So our um, research methodology, we have uh, we're relying on on interpretivist approach, and we have, uh, but we um, there are some kind of quantitative um, data as well. So, so our three modes of um, uh, collecting data are semi-structured questionnaires, interviews, and documentary analysis. The questionnaires are complete, and the data analysis are nearly complete as well. And then um, face to face, uh, we've done the interviews and just beginning to analyze the data now. And then the next, after the analysis of all the um, uh, questionnaire responses and interviews, then we'll um, go to the documentary analysis stage. Um, just so very quickly, um, uh, share with you some of the very, very early emerging themes. And I'm sorry about the the amount of uh, text on, on here, but I'll try to make sense of this for you. Um, so some of the early um, themes that we are, we are beginning to see are, um, so here we have four groups of RHRs, uh, all governors, non-academic staff governors, the leaders, for example, the principal chair and vice chairs, and then the academic staff governors, how they rating um, as activities that are relevant to, to, to their role as the, the Asian staff governors. So things that we are all familiar with, for example, reviewing the vision and strategy and approving policies seem to be highly rated across the board. Perhaps the, the teaching staff governors, there's the last group of, um, and they, they perhaps don't see the, the proving policies as that relevant to their role. Um, but also, again, as perhaps expected, approving uh, staff pay, because they are staff governors, they, uh, across the four institutions, they haven't seen that as a very relevant role because there'll be, there'll be conflict of interest if they are approving their own pay. Um, the, uh, but interestingly, um, because I think people would naturally associate teachers or academics role to students' interests, but um, the four ASGs in this study, they don't see that it's their role to present the views and interests of students. And it could be perhaps because um, there are student governors as well on many governing boards, apart from the schools, but colleges and universities, they have student governors. So there is the constituency there for that purpose. All these ratings, by the way, are out of five. So these are the average ratings. Um, and, but also, um, even though many governors, including the leaders, do, do not believe the academic staff should be involved in the approving the senior leaders' pay and the conditions, but the, the four ASGs AS themselves, they think it's, it's actually an important role for them to be involved with um, or contributing to the decision making of our senior leaders' pay and conditions. So these are uh, just one or uh, two more couple of points. Um, what are the most valued experiences, knowledge, skills of a, an educator, of a teacher, or, or a professor, or a lecturer? Um, so, so I'd like to highlight some of these things um, and the, the teaching experience, obviously, um, and teaching with activities, whether it's at the current institution they work at or at any institution are highly rated. Um, it, the awareness of learners' needs, I think the leaders and many governors think, think that teach, teaching governors um, uh, understanding of this would be important, but the academic staff governors don't seem to be thinking that even though that's important in a governance context, they don't seem to be giving that high value. Um, and, and it's probably because it's the next one here. They seem to be, they're all there. The most uh, valued experience should be the understanding of how the schools and the colleges and universities are managed and they can see as staff members how that's, how that's working or how that's not working. They believe as a third or a second pair of eyes, um, they can bring that independent uh, comment, um, commentary, let's say, on 
how the school is managed. So they seem to value that very highly, the economic staff governors, even though other governors like the leaders and the principals chairs are really um, that aspect of um, knowledge, management knowledge from an economic staff governor and not as highly. Um, but also, again, surprisingly, um, they, the academic staff donors don't think their understanding of teachers' needs um, should be as an as a important one because um, some of the interview comments I can remember, uh, some the staff donors are saying that they cannot possibly uh, present, represent teachers' needs when the staff body is so big that they don't know what the needs are of every single member of the um, um, of of the the workforce, if you like, their colleagues. So, and also there are no arrangements for them to talk to them and bring matters to the governing board. So they don't think that's from a governance context that's that important. Now, some um, emerging themes from the interviews. Again, we have just begun to analyze the interviews. Um, most um, non-academic staff governors, mainly the external governors, for example, feel that um, ASGs uh, should play an important role in holding the management to account. But the academic staff governors themselves are split on this. They're not 100% sure about this. Um, um, for example, about challenging the senior leadership team, one academic staff governor said that even though she's coming to the end of her term, a four-year term, um, that she hasn't had a need to challenge to senior leaders. But that she, if she were to find herself in that situation, she was not sure how she would do that, because she doesn't even know how to go about getting the advice regarding how to challenge the senior leaders. And um, another academic staff governor said um, that she would sometimes chip in um, as a response to, for example, the principal or the, the, the head teacher's um, uh, reports, but not necessarily to support or oppose them, just to give a perspective. But there was one staff governor uh, who, academic staff governor, who said um, that um, with an example, he was able to kind of explain that he would make things clear if uh, the senior leaders are not saying not making things clear to the governing board. And um, in this particular example, said he he um, responded to this uh, uh, the principal's report and said um, that uh, staff didn't, doesn't actually feel that way the way describing the report. Um, and that he felt he had to make it clear. And then he explained that's why the staff decided to go to the union rather than speaking to the senior leaders. So that's an example of um, um, academic staff governors challenging their own managers in the governing board, but the, on the whole, it seems to be a difficult one to actually um, uh, put into practice. Um, so our, because we, we just finished collecting the data and beginning to analyze the data, our future, our, our plans for the future are to produce a typology of ASG's uh, professional status and role in educational governance, and hold an advisory workshop with the uh, Rolling Bell Mass and um, the National Governance Association. And um, we see in advance higher education as well. Uh, we've had contact with them and discussions with them, and they are they seem to be very happy and we're pleased uh, that they would be attending the workshop, which probably would be towards the end of the year. We are beginning to formulate our first kind of series set of blogs based on the current research and not just on governance, but also the idea of researching governance, kind of our experiences and capturing them on a blog, on a website, covering aspects such as democratic governance um, and um, also governance in general. And we hope to present a paper next year at Belmas. We were going to present this year, but because um, our project didn't start um, because of administrative reasons at the right time, we are having to wait now for next year. 
and then hopefully Andy and Bernard, if we could perhaps write a couple of papers as well <laughs> based on this. Um, so, um, yeah, it has um, a lot of resonance with the idea of uh, participatory governance and uh, democratic governance, but we are uh, focusing on one particular aspect, which is um, staff members as educators and their role in, uh, to contribute to the governance of the institutions. So thank you for listening to those, my ramblings there. <laughs> and any questions, uh, please uh, feel free. If we have time, that is Dizana and Nandi. Lovely, thank you so much for sharing, Abdullah.